Well, good morning and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. It's only 4 a.m. here, uh, so my voice is still a little rough. My brain is a little fogged, and uh, I'm still wearing my jammies. <laughs> but uh, uh, I've got to get this uh, recording done before the family wakes up and uh, begins the uh, holiday festivities. <laughs> so let's begin. I've, uh, I'm currently in the middle of reading Middle March. Uh, to tell you the truth, I began this novel way back in January, and I'm only about a third of the way through it. <laughs> and I'll tell you how slow I'm going. It's just, look, life gets in the way. I've got other priorities, and I've had to start and stop this thing several times. But I'm about a third of the way through this. And I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, I know, I know that this is like super critically acclaimed, and everybody loves it, and oh my God, Middle March, and oh... <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, I really don't. Uh, I, I'm reading all of George Eliot's works. Everything that she's ever published. That's my mission. I am reading everything she's ever done in roughly chronological order. So I've read, already read like, what, five or six novels already of hers that I enjoyed much more than this. I don't know what the hell's going on. I mean, I know what's going on. The The, the plot is easy to follow. Uh, that's kind of not the problem, though. I mean, it's 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 like super obvious to me that thing is, that this is really um, I think anyway, it, it seems to me to be like three shorter novels that she was working on simultaneously and then you know, she's just kind of splicing them all together into this crazy um family telenovela <laughs> anyway um i I've, I've got a lot to say about this novel about uh but um i've still got 600 pages to go maybe things will change but um at the rate i'm going i'll review this in about the year 2065 anyway uh <laughs> before that she's writing this thing roughly it takes her about four years to write this thing Roughly in the year 1870, between 1868 and 1872. When was this thing published? 1871, I think. Anyway, anyway, we'll get we'll we'll get to that at the time. While she's with the point is while she's writing this thing in the years that it takes to put Middlemarch together, um, George Eliot's doing this uh, side hustle. This side hustle being a, writing a lot of epic poetry and publishing them in magazines various magazines in the United States and uh, England. And I think I've discussed all of them thus far that she's writing during this time period. She's written um, Agatha, How Lisa Loved the King, The Legend of Jubal, A College Breakfast Party, uh, stuff like that. Anyway, today I'm going to be talking about Armgart. Um, interesting poem that I had to read about four times to kind of figure out what was going on. It's got a lot of really obscure references in here that required a bit of side research, but it made it worthwhile. Um, I'm, I'm able to understand it pretty well, I think, what the heck's going on with this. It's written as a stage production. It's written as a drama, which is appropriate because Armgart, the title character, is a uh, opera singer, a soprano or alto we meet her uh, in the opening pages of this epic poem uh, as she's wrapping up a performance of Orpheus and Erudite, a stage opera. And we meet her backstage as a few other characters, uh, her cousin, a patron, a mentor. They're all discussing her performance and how brilliant her performance is. I mean, she's a, an amazing singer. They say that she is able to act as a conduit for the musical gods, you know, the, the long-dead composer, Christoph uh, Gluck. She is able to channel his original thoughts and impressions through her, her gift as a singer, her gifts as a musician. Uh, just amazing stuff. And Armgart knows it. She believes that her destiny in life is 
through her greatness as the greatest singer ever. Uh, she even says that she's not going to accept second place. It's either I am the greatest singer or I'm nothing. Um, uh, you know, this kind of talk that, that that goes on through a large portion of this poem gets really, um, my God, she's... I understand she's awesome and all, but it's like, um, you know, pull yourself back down to earth, please, <laughs> at some point. And a couple of the characters scold her about that, actually. Anyway, uh, her patron, which is a nobleman named uh, Graf Dornberg, he is a wealthy nobleman, kind of her patron, funder of these arts and everything. Uh, he's He's impressed with her for sure, but, 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 he says backstage, you know... I have to wonder if she's not fulfilling her 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 ultimate you know destiny as a woman, which is being a mother. After all, fame, um, you know, musical ability, uh, adoration from an audience, all of that is transitory. It's going to pass. All of that's going to fade someday. But but. Being a mother, being the you know the fullness of womanhood as being a mother, having a family, is forever. That that um, adulation and that fulfillment will never fade. At least that's his opinion. Well, Armgard um, uh, will will not have such talk. It's it's reminiscent a lot of the another poem that I discussed earlier, which was how Lisa loved the king. In that poem. Uh, well, in the original folk tale, Lisa was in love with King of Aragon. I believe it was King Carlos of Aragon. And uh, George Eliot kind of takes that poem and basically retells it with a subtle, subtle twist in that Lisa is not really in love with the King Carlos as a person so much as she is in love with the status and the authority of of King Carlos of Aragon, you see a bit of a difference there. She's in, she is uh, ambitious for greatness. Well, we got the same thing with Armgard going on here, in that she's rejecting motherhood. She's rejecting um, having a, a a family life because she believes that she is a conduit for the musical gods. Here's what she has to say uh, to Graf Dornberg. Um, when, she, when, when Graf Dornberg says a woman's rank lies in the fullness of her womanhood, therein alone she is royal, Armgart counters, Yes, I know the oft-taught gospel. Woman thy desire shall be. All superlatives on earth belong to men, save the one highest kind to be a mother. Thou shall not desire to do aught, best save pure subservience. Nature has willed it so. O oh, blessed nature, let her be arbitress. She gave me voice, such as she only gives a woman child, best of its kind. Nature gave me ambition, too. Uh, Armgard goes on to say, uh, after Graf Dornberg suggests that uh, Armgard leave the opera and become a mother, <laughs> Armgard just is aghast. She says, what? Leave the opera with my part ill sung while I was warbling in a drawing room? Sing in the chimney corner to inspire my husband reading the news? Let the world hear my music only in his morning speech? less stammering than most honorable men's. No, tell me that my song is poor, my art the piteous feat of weakness aping strength that were fit proem to your argument. Till then, till then I am an artist by my birth, by the same warrant that I am a woman. Nay, in the added rarer gift I see supreme vocation, if a conflict comes, perish, no, not the woman, but the joys which men makes narrow by their narrowness. Oh, I am happy, the great masters write for women's voices, and great music wants me. I need not crush myself within a mold of nature, 
a part of me, I need not crush myself within a mould of theory called nature. I have room to breathe and grow unstunted. So you see, yeah, Armgard is exceptionally ambitious through her gifts as a singer. Uh, she will not accept second place. She will not accept the fate of being a, a, a wife and a mother only to sing uh, <laughs> for the pleasure of her husband and sing for, uh, for guests in the house. She wants to stand in front of an audience. She wants to express the pitiable art uh, audience's inability to express their artistic beauty. She will do that for him, for them. She will do that for the audience. That is her gift. Um, Armgard goes on to say that what would this world be if I were to lose my gift, to lose my voice? <laughs> Which, unfortunately, is a premonition <laughs> because that is exactly what happens. Armgard uh, gets sick. She goes to see a quack doctor with some... <laughs> some goofy home medication and she loses her voice oh my god she loses her abilities to sing uh, really tragic and a lot of existential fretting goes on after this uh, she goes Armgard goes to her cousin or Ar yeah she I would, let, let's back up she goes to, to Graf Dornberg and Graf Dornberg uh, tries to have her accept a, a domestic lifestyle and Armgard says hell no and so Graf Dornberg leaves. After she loses her voice, Armgard frets and tries to come to grip with her the new reality that she doesn't want to be a wife, she doesn't want to be a mother, but damn it, she can't sing either. What am I to do? Uh, she goes to her cousin, um, Fraulein Valperga, and this is what she says uh, in her fretting that she has lost her voice. Armgard says, um, Heaven made me a royal, wrought me out with subtle finish towards preeminence, made every channel of my soul converge to one high function, and then heaven flung me down, that breaking I might turn to subtlest pain. Blah, blah, blah. Armgard goes on to say, All the world now is but a rack of threads to twist and dwarf me into pettiness and basely feigned content, the placid mask of women's misery. In other words, Armgard says, I'm just going to be another woman. I'm going to be one of the mob of commoners, of common women. I've got I've to accept the, you know, their fate also. And uh, her cousin, Fraulein Valperga, um, has pretty much had enough of this kind of talk. Uh, she tries to bring uh, Armgard kind of back down to earth. Uh, she's got these visions of greatness, and she's been humbled that she has lost her vehicle of, of artistic talent. And, she, and her cousin brings her down to earth. You know, look... <laughs> She says, as the few born like you to easy joy, cradled with privilege, take for natural on all the lowly faces that must look upward to you. What revelation now shows you the mask or gives presentiment of sadness hidden? You who every day these five years saw me limp to wait on you, and thought the order perfect which gave me the girl without pretension to be aught a splendid cousin for my happiness etc so her cousin kind of tries to bring her down to earth look you're a, you're not one of the gods all right yeah you had this amazing talent a very rare talent you had these ideas of greatness and you're willing to sacrifice everything for that Come back down to earth now. You've been humbled. <laughs> I hate to say it, but uh, sometimes that happens in life. So Armgard does. She becomes, I guess you could say humbled, and she comes back down to earth. Next scene, she's talking to her mentor named Leo. He's an elderly man, and 
he's been her, her mentor as a musician and as a singer. And as she's talking to him, um, Leo, or Armgard is, is discussing with Leo, her mentor, what she's going to be doing with the rest of her life. Um, shall I be a teacher? I, 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 shall, I, shall I be a conductor? Shall I be a singing teacher? Uh, you know, if you can't do it, teach it. You know, that kind of thing. And Leo says, well, he hints that he has gone through something very similar in his life. You remember, he's elderly. We don't know anything about Leo except that he's elderly and he is a mentor. And we get hints that, yes, I've, I've been through this. I was once a great composer and I got all this fire and passion out of me when I was younger. But that was long ago and things change. And Armgart asks uh, Leo for, oh, I did not know that about you. Um, tell me more. Give me detail. And Leo says, no, that's okay. That's okay. Let's, let's not talk about that. Let's, um, let's talk about what you're going to be doing. Let's, let's talk about you being a teacher and a mentor of young singers yourself. And that's kind of where the poem ends. Um, interesting poem. Here's a little backdrop to George Eliot's own life as she's writing this poem that I don't think we can forget. Remember that George Eliot, the time of writing this in 1870, George Eliot has just turned 50 years old. She's no longer a, uh, a swinging single, you know, in an open marriage swapping partners. She's happily with George Henry Lewis, but one of George Henry Lewis's uh, sons has just died, and George Eliot herself, 50 years old, she's childless. Uh, she will never have children of her own. And she never talks about that in her, um, her journals and her private diaries. That's her private life, and I guess we'll never know. But um, I think it's important to have that backdrop in her real life when reading poems like this when reading poems like Armgard and How Lisa Loved the King. Remember, George Eliot also is considered the greatest in her own profession. I mean, at the time when she's writing Middlemarch, people recognize that she is probably the greatest English writer uh, of her time. Remember, George Eliot also has, she understands how great she is. She wants to be the next Shakespeare. I'm firmly convinced of that. Not in style, but at least in uh, influence. Yeah, this is her ambition. So she's writing these poems about these ambitious women uh, who give up everything of a domestic life, who give up being a mother for the cause of their ambition. And in the case of Armgart, yeah, that, that, that dream that they have that status that they have, it's, it is actually transitory. It can go away. So something to keep in mind uh, what's, what's going on in her real life. So anyway, yeah, interesting poem. So I'll be back, I guess, in three or four years when I finish Middlemarch to discuss this novel. Um, um, and until then... You guys take care and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you've made it this far, thank you again for watching and take care.